Well, technology is interesting. And uh, yeah. I guess for all of us on here now, thank you. And I apologize for waiting. Um, we will do our best to try to figure out how to best to get these two things to connect. But Jerry and I have been getting acquainted anyway. And Ariane is uh, on our team in mobilization funding and been keeping us company and entertaining. Um, but nonetheless, thank you for joining. We'll get right to it. Jerry Aliberti from Pro Excel. Pro Excel is the owner. He is a consulting firm, and I'm so grateful for him to join here. Him and I talked, got connected on LinkedIn. We've shared, I mean, truly, truthfully, we met on LinkedIn, shared back and forth. I loved his content. We reached out to one another, had several conversations, and we thought it'd be really valuable to help share some of his knowledge with our collective networks. So, Jerry, please welcome and uh, let everybody know who you are, a little bit about yourself, and what we're going to talk about today. Scott, thanks for having me on board, man. Yeah, I mean, we met uh, a few months back and it, it's just seemed right for us to connect, right? So um, I've been in the New York City infrastructure civil market industry for the last 20 years. Uh, I've worked bold out in the field, building highways, bridges, roadways, um, utilities, foundations, small, small buildings. Uh, in addition, I've also been a senior estimator in the office, estimating up to, I would say, over $8 billion worth of work. Um, you know, doing construction in the middle of New York City, Manhattan, and the five boroughs, it, it, it probably doesn't get any any harder than that, right? You know, so you, you really see what works, you really see what doesn't work. Uh, you're working around a lot of contractors, millions and millions of people. I mean, you're literally building structures over people's heads, right? So there's just there's just so much that goes in that's that's involved in the daily operations. But uh, I've been fortunate enough to work with some great companies, you know, companies ranging from $30 million a year, $100 million a year, 400 and also a billion dollars a year, right? So each and every one of those companies has their own ways of doing things. Uh, you know, so I've, 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 I've made tons of mistakes myself and I've done a lot of things right myself as well. Right. So being a part of some great teams, um, I now broke away from, from the salary world and, um, I'm now helping contractors. I would say between five to $30 million a year contractors, um, helping them grow their companies, both in the, on, on the estimating side and also on the project management side. So, um, I would say my, my main area is, is the operations part. You know, one of the things that drew me to you that is was your vulnerability. You talked a lot about the mistakes you made and just how your your passion was to help people not make the same ones. Right. And you and I honed right in on one of the things that I think some people struggle with the most, particularly in this last couple of years, is estimating. So let's jump right into that because I think that's what drew a lot of people's attention. It's certainly something I get a lot of questions on. What do you feel is the best process or most important thing or things to discuss when you're starting to look at estimating, you know, and you have companies on here that are all different sizes. So they have some people have estimating departments, others are the individual. So I guess let's, talk, let's kind of narrow it in and with the goal of trying to help folks um, create a structure they can work off of based on your experience. Well, I would say for one is don't put yourself in a position where you become desperate, right? And, 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 and you need to bid everything under the sun. I mean, you know, a lot of people talk about finding your niche, which is really important, but you also need to diversify as well, right? You know, there's, there's construction, you'll go a couple of years where you're getting hit with a lot of private work, and then you'll go a couple of years where you're getting a lot of, of public work. You know, the good thing about public work, which is my main background, is there's always money coming in, in, in public work. Yeah, you'll have those slow uh, times, but you know, there, there's always money coming in. So for one, you got to diversify your portfolio as well, right? So, you know, why, why do some contractors bid when they get desperate and they, and they, and they bid cheap work? It's, it's because they wait too long. You know, a lot of owners that I speak to are coming from the field. They never really estimated. And, you know, you only win one out of every eight bids, one out of every 10 bids, whatever your ratio is. And you got to be in a really good position where you're always bidding work. If you have a big backlog, put more profit on the job. You will land one of those jobs every once in a while. Those are good jobs to have when you have a lot of profit. A lot of people are, are scared to keep bidding because they don't have the resource. They don't have the people, which is a, a, a major problem, you know, but uh, you need to keep bidding work um, so you don't get desperate. And, and, and when your backlog is, 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 is going down, well, 
now you made all your profits when, when things were great, but then you're going to go through two, three years where your backlog is down and you're going to be spending all that money that you had saved away in the bank for a rainy day on, 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 um, on increasing your backlog and bringing all your people from the field into the office to estimate, you know? Let's, so, let's, um, talk, let's touch on that a little bit. I, I hear often a lot of questions I'm asked. Um, we might be looking at a project and we analyze margin with the customer and we go to the customer and say, hey, man, this is really thin margin. We, we, you know, we can or can't help you or we can help you, but it's under these guidelines. Like, why did you bid it so thin? And, and sometimes they really did. They bid it intentionally thin. Um, and the things I hear is, you know, I, I wanted to try to get this customer. I wanted to try to be able to like win that bid to prove I can do good work. And then, you know, can you touch on that a little bit. What is your philosophy and thought process on using your bid or low margin or lower cost, I guess, however you want to look at it? Because you can have a lower cost be, be the highest margin too. It's really based on your business. But what's your thought process on that if you have clients or, or others that you've heard mention those kind of comments and what do you suggest? Well, you know, I know one contractor in particular, he admitted that he bids low margins on, on every single project because he pushes his crews to push change orders. Well, what happens if there's not a change order on the, I mean, I mean there, there's always going to be change orders, but what happens if, if there's not a, a, the right amount of change orders? I mean, that, that to me is a bit reckless and, and, and it's a bit dangerous, right? Um, so to bid a cheap job just to impress your, 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 uh, or, or to build your reputation with a new contractor. I mean, you know, to me, that's a bit reckless as well, right? Because what happens if that project doesn't go that well, right? What happens if your project team isn't perfectly aligned with, with all the, um, with, with the scope of work that, that you have set forth on that project, it, it, you know, it becomes a bit reckless. I mean, I wouldn't go that way. Um, I would rather just sit down with those contractors, take them out to a nice lunch, take them out to a dinner and build my reputation that way, rather than trying to impress them on, on the project side, because anything can go wrong. And it does. I mean, construction is so difficult. Anything and everything will probably go wrong, you know, it, and it, it gets a little scary because, you know, cash flow becomes disrupted that way. And, uh, and that's where people become very desperate. Let's dive into that a little bit. So in order to bid low um, or lower margin, you have to know your costs, right? Yeah. Um, if you're going to even add markup versus margin on your job, you still need to know your costs. So costs are a foundation of any estimate or bid. So I think where a lot of folks may get it right or wrong is in the costs, right? So let's talk about that. You're, you're an expert on estimating. You give advice. You bid lots of big work. You bid small work. What do you do? How do you figure out your costs? What costs do you need to make sure are included? And like, let's just talk about the process of analyzing your costs so you can then therefore figure out what you do want to bid. Yeah, so for one, if you're working on Excel spreadsheets, I will get away from Excel spreadsheets. You gotta, you gotta really look into some new software. For me, it was always HCSS, which is the predominant uh, software program for civil infrastructure contractors. Um, with this software, you're, you're able to establish master estimates, right? And then you're able to, to, to use that master estimate and start a new bid. So uh, you have your foundation set, right? Um, and then from there, you're able to break down your items. You're able to break down all your activities, right? And then at the end, when you're done estimating, you're able to spit out reports, which is basically your audit of your project, right? So based on your schedule, you're able to look at these reports and you're able to see if things make sense. For example, if you got a 12 month job and in your items, you have a label form and worked in for seven months, let's say, well, you have subs on that project, right? So your label form is not always working, but you need to have a label form for the majority of your project, right? The same thing for possibly an equipment operator, right? Who needs to support the subs. Well, if you're missing three, four months of a label form and or three, four months of an operator, you need to add that into your overhead. You know, it's, it's not working to your productions. So what I find is that a lot of contractors towards the end of the job, their profits start running away from them and they're scratching their heads like, well, you know, what's happening here? It's probably because of that. You know, that's, that's what I find happening a lot on, on projects as well. Or you know, to, to back up, and, and this kind of goes with the, with the field as well, is, um, you know, you need to escalate your material properly as well. Um, are, you, are, you, are you assuming that you're going to buy all this material up front 
and and then the field made the wrong assumption and they bought all the material on, on the back end and, and they waited too long for purchase orders. So these are conversations that when you estimate, you kind of need to put together a presentation for your field staff as well, if they're not already involved in the estimating process as well, which that can get a little complicated too, right? Because the field is always going to want to add money to the bid, which is very easy to do. But as an estimator, you know, I was always taught it's very easy to make a $10 million job, a $12 million job. It's what, what makes estimating so difficult is making it a $9 million, $900,000 project. That's, and, and, and actually building it and, and making it a, prof, uh, a profitable project as well. So, you, um, yep. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, how do you recommend adding overhead um, and your, like you said, your, your hard administrative costs, whether it's either upfront in the job, knowing what they are, allocating them to certain jobs overall or not? How did you go about doing that in your process? So do you mean overhead, like, like office expenses, like accounting and payroll or and shop? Uh, you yeah, know, great question. So, so to me, that means anything that's not directly on that job, that's going to end up being in your schedule value. So that's all of your insurances. That's your yeah. debt services. That's your equipment. That's your, you know, office admin payroll labor. You know, it's got to come from somewhere, right? It comes from profit overall, but like, how do you build that in? So this is where private work and public work really, really uh, becomes different, right? So public work is very, very competitive. I mean, you'll have a lot of bidders on, on projects. Um, I, it's very unusual to start putting in money for your accounting and your payroll and your shop expenses and all that kind of stuff in, in your overhead. Um, I do hear that it's, it's more common and you, you have more of a luxury to do that on, on the private world because you're able to negotiate your prices a little bit more. You're able to include and exclude stuff in your scope. That's not the case in public works, right? So it's a competitive bid. It's an open, it's an open bid. It's a rip and read bid. Whoever's the lowest person wins the project. So, um, Again, going back to the software, you're able to break down your, your, your items as direct costs and indirect costs. Indirect costs is your, is your overhead, right? It's your insurance, it's, it's your bond information, for example. It, it, I'm sorry, it's your bond costs. It's all these additional costs that I'm talking about, possibly risk, right? If you're going to venture out into a, different, into a different scope of work, you should probably put together a risk adju adjustment sheet and, and add that to your bid especially if it's your first project doing something that you're not too familiar with. And then from there, you have to spread those numbers. So again, if it's a unit price bid, you have to spread those numbers in each of the unit prices. If it's an overrun, you probably would put more of that overhead and profit in because you know you're gonna be getting more of that. If it's an underrun, you're, you're gonna put less of your overhead and profit, maybe even take money out of that and put it into other, into other items as well. So it's really important that you spread your numbers accordingly as, as, as well. Does that answer your question, Scott? Or Yeah, I think, um, so let me put myself on the spot for a second. Um, and I want you to ask, answer this honestly. I've often told contractors that the most important thing to any project isn't the price to win it. It's to finish it for profit, performance. And candidly, I think owners and I think general contractors if I'm referring to a subcontractor who's our typical client, I would tell them, you know, the most important thing to anyone is that you perform the job. The most important thing to you is perform it and make profit. Now, in order to do that, you, of course, have to win it and you have to execute it. All right. So that said, what I will tell them, though, is I said, look, your costs are your costs, how you're running your business, the amount of people you have in it. Um, there's there's costs that are just yours. We're, they have to be accounted for unless you're going to be willing to thin those out. So you, you need to know that you need to make sure you account for those in all your bids and bid the work at the best possible price you can, but considering all your costs, not bid to win, bid to win, but include your costs. And then I often will hear, well, I may not win any bids then. And so then I'll say, well, then you just need to bid more. If you win one out of 10 jobs, then you need to start bidding 20 jobs a time because you think, well, that's going to add more costs. Okay, well, then you need to look at your costs. That's what I'll say. Your costs are too high then. You're, you're in a field that you just you just can't do the work at, a, at an affordable price for yourself to make a margin. Something else is wrong inside the business, not necessarily at the market level. So I asked that question to you. Am I giving good advice in your opinion or is that something wrong? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, how do you how do you bid work that you're not really familiar with? Uh, also, in, in addition, is you need to understand your resources, right? So, just recently, I was was working with a contractor, and it was a heavy excavation project, and he had a couple of months of having five, six dump trailers on 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 the run, and he only owns two. Well, in the bid, he had it. He had the rate that reflected him. It was an ownership rate, right? So now he needed to rent dump trailers for several months. It's a higher rate. Well, he needed to make an adjustment to those rates as well. So it's small things like that 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 can add up to be big bucks as, as well. And and usually those costs add up to you or, or or catch up to you towards the middle and and the back end of the project as well. But like how I said before too is, you know, if a contractor feels feels that desperation and kind of needs to venture out in, in, into different avenues they should put together a, a risk assessment sheet as well and, and put a value to each of those risks that they're taking and potentially either hedge it and you know if they come up with two hundred fifty thousand dollars of, of risk you know maybe they could hedge it to 125 thousand or put the full 250 in if, if they're really not familiar with it as well but you need to understand your resources you know, it's also good to get your project management involved in the pre-bid process in this particular situation as well, because they can give you their comfort level of running the project as well and kind of give you that, you know, a little bit more of that warm, fuzzy feeling of, of, um, of being able to run the project accordingly. But then when you win the job, right, like how you said, your cost is your cost. So with that being said is how are you getting those numbers out to the field? Is the field understanding what the real cost is? I find that most contractors don't get that cost out to the field. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, it could be something as simple as as a simple as a simple spreadsheet, just to let them know, hey, this item has extra overhead and profit, and this item doesn't. If it's a unit price project, if it's if it's a lump sum, you got to kind of break it down a little bit more. You know, lump sum is is a lot more complicated because you don't have unit takeoffs to go by an engineer's takeoff, right? So a lump sum project, you're coming up with your own takeoffs. And that's where it's really important to have good relationships with your subs because your subs are relying on you to give them all these all these different takeoffs, right? And, and you don't want to just start giving away all your takeoffs to people that you don't have a good relationship with. Or if you think they had, or if you think that you have a good relationship with them, they're going to go off and they're going to give your takeoff to, to, to your competition as well. And that's not a good... That's not a great uh, situation as well. So it's funny, you bring up a great point. Um, Suzanne Cox with uh, Saltmarsh, she's a CPA. She's a construction expert, accounting CPA. Um, I've had her on many times and we've done a lot of things together. But one of the things she said is the most critical thing that she suggests and that companies need to do that for their own success, but they don't, is to have project management and accounting meet weekly so they understand exactly what you just mentioned and to avoid those problems. Because if your accounting and staff department and estimating understand what's going on price-wise, and but project management doesn't, you're done. If project yeah. management doesn't explain to accounting where they're at, what needs to be ordered, where they're at, they can't manage cash. And it's those two teams that don't really talk or communicate on a regular basis. So as a leader in, in, of a company, Putting them together, she says, is critical. And it's like one of the first things that she suggests anytime she has a new client and it makes a ton of difference in the world. And, and it solves exactly what you just mentioned is the problem. Field and in-house not knowing what to talk about. Well, well, that's well, that's where good software comes into play as well. And to answer Dave's question in, in the comments, uh, the software I'm talking about is HCSS. And they also have <clears throat> other programs where you can record live, the productions out in the field in, 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 in daily, you know, every single day you put your productions in and then at the end of the week or the end of the month, when you put your payroll in, it, it matches your productions based on how many units you installed versus your payroll. And it tells you right there. And then if you're making money or if you're not making money, and then that, and then that work gets shot back to the, to the estimating department. Right. And then every single month you should have um, project reviews as well. But um. I, I've been in, in a lot of situations where when I was in estimating, I would ask a project manager, hey, can you give me productions? Can you give me your unit costs on, on this particular scope? And I mean, more often than not, most had no idea how to even break down those, those productions, right? <clears throat> and then I would, I would kind of give them a cheat sheet and, and, and they still had trouble getting those numbers back. And 
you know, it all, it all comes back to the company. Well, why aren't these people being trained to, to track costs? I mean, it all, you know, our business is all about profit, right? So if, if, if you're not tracking costs and, and, and you don't understand your cash flow, then, then how can you possibly, how can you possibly have a successful company? You know? So. Well, in sales, we used to call that spray and pray when, when yeah. sales reps would come in and just puke everything out. Um, we used to yeah. have that <laughs> medical device term, but I guess you just found the construction equivalent of you just do it and hope maybe is uh, right, right. not a good strategy. Right. Let, me, let me dial up. Let me change this to a couple of things that come up often. Just quick questions. Does the terms of payment um, from your customer on the RFP or what you're bidding, does that impact the price that you would charge from a margin or profit perspective? What I mean by that is you're bidding a job that pays you in 30 days versus a job or GC contractor that pays in 60. Does that impact the price you offer? I mean, as a GC, that's, that, that, that's more... More as a sub, I mean, really. You're more as a sub, not as a GC. Because the GC can typically handle or wait longer. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, why would you ask for 60 day term, a 60 day term contract anyways? I mean, I would, I would get it in 30 day terms. I, you know, yeah. I, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that they ask for that. I'm just saying yeah. that that's what it is. You know, it is 60 day terms or maybe it says 30, but it's just undoubtedly known that it's going to be longer, right? It's going to be 60. And maybe it's not the GC either. It's just the owner, you know, like I'll give you an example. In Florida, the Orlando Airport, for example, the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority is widely known as taking a long time to pay, longer, 60 days, not 30. There are 30 day contracts, and but the, and the GCs are paid, you know, paid when paid all the way through. So that's that's just a known fact, right? Or it, it happens often. And there's other other folks that might be only 30. Would you bid your projects differently knowing you're going to be paid in 60 days versus 30? Well, I'll tell you right now, I've spoken to a lot of contractors, subcontractors who know that if a GC you're working for isn't good in making payments, they'll automatically increase their prices to you. So um, if that answers your question at all, I would say if, 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 if someone understands that you're a late payer, they will increase their price and, and it just takes away your bidding advantage as well. So, yeah. I mean, I would never go beyond 30 days. That's also a good thing with public works as well is that um, the public agencies also track how the GCs are paying their subs as well. And that's, you know, especially since you have to have um, a minority participation on your project. Now it's up to like 30% here in, uh, in the New York area. Yeah, and I would say, look, the reason why you need to increase your price is because you're going to have to float more labor. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to float more uh, material costs. And th those are, those are, those are going to have costs to it. Floating that is going to have extra costs. It might be debt service, might be tapping your lines of credit. You might have to borrow money to, to operate on a contract that's 60 days instead of 30. So those are the, those are the reasons why it's warranted, at least in my opinion, to, or you should consider. Right. And this, and this goes back to your original, this goes back to your original conversation. If I could just add one more thing is that this is why it's good to have a good reputation with your contractors as well, because, you know, when it comes down to bid time and, and you are desperate, you know, you can call these guys up and say, hey, can I have your best and final number to go into the bid? And then that'll normally give you that, 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 that advantage to kind of bring you over, over that hump that, that you need to be at to get that low bid. I've seen that many, many times. Yeah, between a GC making a call to their trade partners. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of states don't allow that to go into the bid. You have to have a certain, you know, you have to have contractors submitted with the bid as well of, of who you're going to use. But but again, it becomes you know it comes down to a commitment pre bid, and that's why having a good reputation with your contractors is is really important. I'm going to hit another hot topic for you on estimating retainage. All right. Yeah. So if you have 10% retainage, let's use that as a round number. That typically seems to be a common number. Um, and retainage is now, let's say it's 10% and you're bidding your cost. You're looking at your estimate and you know, you need to bid thin. How do you factor in retainage with your estimate? And knowing the fact of what all we've talked about today is you do need to execute the project and you do need to make a profit. Yeah, um, you know, that's that's a tough call. I think it all depends on, on the financial situation of that particular company, right? So I know you work with mobilization and cash flow, but um, I do see a lot where contractors need to put um, a 
a cost in to borrow money to get the project going for a certain duration and within and within that contract. So it all depends on the financial situation of, of the contractor as well. Uh, I mean, that's 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 all I've really seen on on my end. Um, I know I know I, I I typically see five percent, and I'm seeing more and more ten percent. So um, it hasn't really been a major problem with the with the certain situations that I've seen, but. Um, I think the only way to really account for that is, is borrowed money and, and, and to put that premium in, in the bid. Well, let me ask you this. So let's, let's just say, for example, you're, you get a new consulting client, you're, you're doing an analysis on their estimating. And for, for easy, let's just say they're, they're any trade part, roofing, plumbing, electrical, whatnot. And they're bidding projects at you know, a 14 to 16% margin. Okay. And you look at their analysis and it actually is a 14 to 16% margin. But most of their projects have 10% retainage. So in my mind, in our world, that automatically means you're going to have, if it's 14% minus 10% retainage, you're going to have to operate this project with 4% profit to execute, right? All of your profit, in this particular case, 75% of it is in the retainage bill, which you're never going to see. So what would you do in that scenario or how do you analyze that? What's, what's your steps in the process as a consultant looking at an estimate that shows that? Well, Scott, I think it's, it's part of the risk that you got to take in, in this business as well. Right. And, and this goes back to the original conversation is don't bid jobs when you're desperate and, and, and bid low and cheap or else you're never going to get a job. You know, that, that mindset, it's going to put you in a tough situation because um, you need to have, those funds put away for this particular situation. I mean, every contractor, in my opinion, is going through this exact situation. You know, um, it, it's part of the risk of owning a, a construction company. Um, you got to really get your cash flow down right. Uh, you got to have good teams to push your projects for you so you can get these profits, right? You know, that's another whole conversation is, is you know, based on, 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 on the stats that you just said, I mean, what happens if the project doesn't go the right way? you know, it, it becomes a lot more complicated. So, um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's part of the risk of, of being a contractor. Uh, you know, you can keep putting money inside of your bid and, and bid everything at 20%, but then, but, then, but then you'll never get a job as well, so. Right. You know, one of the things about construction I think is interesting is, and you hit the nail on the head, is there's so much risk, right? There's so many opportunities to lose what profit you built into it. Yeah. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is there's also so many opportunities to save money too. There's so many opportunities to gain some efficiencies there. They may not always be there, but you know, I go back to one example. We have a roofing contractor years ago. We worked on, it was actually a public works job. They also did have a pretty thinner, thinner margin than they normally would have for obvious reasons. It was an RFP closed bid. They won. They were re-roofing a VA hospital. Um, so they did, but you know, one of the ways they've always estimated a bid is they always went about building their um, schedule based on their ability to cash flow it. So it would be like one crew goes out, sort of, I'm just going to be generalized, demo the roof, right? Pick it, clean it, get the other, get the sub, get it down to the subsurface. Then the, the next crew would come out and surface it. And then the third crew would come out and kind of finish it, right? But what they did, they happened to, meet us and we were the, it was the first loan we ever did with them. So when they realized they had the cash up front, they knew what their expenses were. They rethought about the way they were going to go at that job. And they actually put two crews out there and had one start ripping and another one follow them right away. Long story short is they were able to execute the job in only six weeks instead of 10 weeks that they normally estimated. And that four weeks of payroll made that job, that four weeks of payroll savings made that job significantly more um, profitable. Whereas, you know, so, so there's, there's opportunities like that, I think, in there too, is when you do look at the opportunities for cash or what savings you have or how you go about executing the schedule. Now, you might not have that opportunity 50% of the way through the job because there might be other trades on the rear, there might be, but there's, you got to look at the whole overall job schedule too and find out the places where you can gain, gain efficiencies and not burn up cost. Well, well, absolutely. And, and it also saves a lot of money on, on your overhead costs as well, right? Because the more you extend the project, the more 
overhead costs you're going to have, for example, management, right? Or, or uh, it increases the chances of, of more escalation. And then the more you stretch out that project, I mean, you know, talking about a roofer, you want to be in and you want to be out because of the very reason that you just brought up, there's going to be other trades there. There may be a, an HVAC trade that's got to come in. The electrician's got to come in to do electrical work up on, up on top of the roof. You want to be in and you want to be out. You don't want to have all these guys mingling with, with, with your guys as well, because all it's going to do is slow down your productions and it's going to extend your schedule. But it's important to understand your critical path as well in your schedule. I mean, in that particular situation, it's only four weeks. So the critical path is pretty straightforward. But if you're bidding a, a 12 month project or a two month project, you really need to understand your critical path items and you need to really, really prioritize on those critical path items as well. Uh, and, <clears throat> and get your submittals and get all your paperwork done in the very, very beginning of the project. So you can hit that really hard. Yeah. All right, I want to ask you a question. Um, some basic criteria on bidding. Do you, are there certain percentages that you think should be followed or guidelines that should be followed for you should have at least this much profit or material should be X amount of your bid or overhead or labor, equipment, financing? Like, you know, if your overall bid's X, like as you're breaking it down, does that fit? Is there, is there any guidelines that you sort of think through? Well, I mean, you always need to have waste on your materials, right? So there's some waste. I mean, I, I know some contractors like to use 5% waste. Some contractors like, like to use 7% waste uh, on certain materials. Um, then there's always the fluff factor on debris disposals, uh, right? So there's some contractors who like to use a 60% fluff on, on soil disposal. Some contractors like to use a 200% fluff, right? which is pretty extreme in my opinion. Um, as far as profit goes, I mean, that, that is, is up to the contractor, um, to start bidding jobs. I, I I've, I've heard many situations where contractors bid jobs at, at 0%, right? Because for the very reason that you brought up, they wanted to, uh, to get into a job or they just haven't picked up a job in so long because they waited too long to bid more work. And they got like into this red zone where they just needed to get work to pay for overhead. I mean, that's a bit scary, right? You know, should someone do that? Should they do that? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, to me, absolutely not. But that's why you need to keep bidding, right? So even if you're really busy, you bid work with a higher profit margin. You just keep bidding work. You know, it's like what Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. I mean, if you're not bidding and you're not bidding, you're just going to keep missing work. So just keep bidding, even if you got to increase your profit margins. I, I've, you know, several of the companies that I've worked for as well in the past, you know, we would just throw in flyers, you know, we'll know the cost is, is, is X amount of dollars, that, you know, let's say 10 million, and we'll throw in a 20, 25% profit margin. And once in a while, you'll hit those jobs. And those are great jobs. You know, those are great jobs to have. It's a great problem to have. Question for you. There's a question in the audience. I'll ask it since I'm seeing it here. Yeah. If you're a smaller company and you are outsourcing your estimating, what would the average cost be on a $1 million job? What would the, well, I, I mean, that's, that's tough to answer. You know, when, when you I don't know if they mean the cost of outsourcing the actual estimating, or if you mean, the Oh, cost oh the well, I'm not, I'm not too sure about that because some, because some out, some companies, what they'll do is they'll charge per page, which I never really understand. For me, it's like, okay, well, it's a $1 million job. It's going to take me X amount of hours to do this. This is my cost based on whatever their hourly rates are. You know, you got to be careful because there's a lot of estimating companies now that are all outsourcing overseas. Um, you know, that's, 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 that's really difficult. Um, you, really want, you really want somebody to understand your market as well. I'm becoming more and more of a fan of outsourcing because I know it's becoming insanely difficult to find estimators, right? It, it is very difficult to find estimators. Uh, the younger generation just doesn't want to sit in, in offices, right? So people are like, well, well how am I going to estimate my work? So more people, more contractors are opening up to outsourcing. So um, I am open to outsourcing. I think, it's, I think it's, it's a great idea. Maybe not so much on the cost end of it. I was working with a contractor not too long ago and it was a $1 million project. Um, and he, he had this, this firm come up with takeoffs, put a cost to it, but didn't give him the breakdown of all of his takeoffs. He didn't give 
a breakdown of how he came up with all of his unit prices. You know, he didn't, he didn't give a breakdown of it was, it was a landscaping project, right? So how much are you allocating for specific trees? How much are you allocating for the, the benches and the trash receptacles and all the different playground um, uh, components? You know, so he, he was going to submit a bid and he had no idea if this person had any idea of, of, what, these, of, of what these costs actually were. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'm kind of going off, but that's really difficult to, to kind of yeah. answer. You know, you need to really analyze that. I think if you outsource an estimator, um, you got to look at it and treat it the same way you look at hiring. This is my personal opinion. If you're hiring someone to solve the problem and you feel like just get just the, making them an offer and them accepting it is the end of your problem and you're done, mm -hmm. you're in big trouble. No. And the same thing is if you have problem estimating and you're going to hire an estimator service or person outsourced and you think Phew, problem over and expect them to know everything for your business in your world, you're also setting yourself up for more failure. So I guess what I would say to do there is make sure you invest the time to, to educate and train whoever you hire, outsource service, inside service, individual new hire employee. Really teach and train them what your costs are, what you do, what you're thinking, what your thought process is, so that they're estimating in line with exactly what your thoughts are as the owner or the business leader in any particular fashion. Well, as far as in as far as in-house estimating goes, you know, you know, one of my biggest pet peeves is, you know, a lot of owners or a lot of chief estimators, if it's a larger company, say that they're too busy to review estimates, right? Well. I mean, that's, that's pretty scary, right? So you put together an estimate, you know, I always like to say, well, your estimating needs to be done one week prior to the bid date, right? So it has, so, <clears throat> so whomever has a chance to review that bid, you need to put a second set of eyes on these bids because who's miscalculating the amount of material you need, who has another opinion based on their previous experience and knowledge of, of productions, right? Maybe your productions are twice as much as what they should be based on historical data that that specific person has. Every bid should be checked by a second set of eyes. Now, when you're, now when you're checking that set, set, I'm sorry, when you're checking that bid, you should bring in your junior estimators and your younger estimators, and you should train them while you're reviewing that bid as well. I know it's a little, it, it, it's a lot of extra effort, but it, it's part, I mean, it, Every construction company starts in the estimating department. You got to win bids to go to go build bids, right? So it all starts in estimating. You got to have a solid, solid estimating department. And, I mean, then, and then you might yeah. make you might not make money in the estimating department, but you can lose it for sure. If you start oh, right. in a bad spot, you're losing money out of the gate, uh, and you're putting a, a tremendous burden on your field team, which already has enough of a burden just dealing with the flows in, of a construction site anyway, just to execute what otherwise was a well-managed bid, you know? Yeah, well, when you win a job and the job does well, the project management team usually praises themselves, right? But when the job doesn't go well, they always blame it on the estimators. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a very tough life to be a, a full-time estimator because you go many months without winning work. And um, especially when you're working for larger firms and, and, and you spend several months working on one specific project, you can go months and months without winning and, and without feeling that sense of achievement as well. So it's really important that you run your estimating department really well and, and, um, and you have the right software where everybody knows the system and the process of going through a bid from day one to the very end. And, and you got to celebrate wins as well. So, so there's two questions um, in the audience of the chat I want to ask you. Sergio asks, um, I had seen some positions that asked for a mixed profile between estimator and project manager. Do you think that's a good situation? You mean as experience goes? Well, naturally, that, that's my experience. And I can tell you this, as an estimator, it's built a tremendous amount of confidence in me to make decisions while I'm estimating. I mean, big decisions, multi-million dollar decisions to put certain stuff in the bid or even take some stuff out of the bid based on my knowledge of running the project. So, I mean, I ran my own projects as the number one person out in the field. So for me, I know all the little details 
that have to be put into a bid, but I also have the confidence to take money out because I feel like I may be double dipping in, in some situations as well. So, I mean, to answer his question and give a, a really honest opinion, I, I really think you need to have field experience to really be, you know, a, a very confident estimator. Yeah. You know, the way I would answer that is um, I agree with you. I think if, if, if what's perfect would be a great mix of project management experience versus estimating. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. if your project managers all had to estimate their own work and then execute it, they'd probably go about it a little different and vice versa. If you had a project manager on the field that had to estimate the things you're going to know, the type of things that go on in the field, the way you're going to execute something, you're looking at a, a takeoff or a set of drawings and you just know to build that it's going to take this, this and this instead of what might be a normal per square foot cost. Like you, you can't, not every, not every square foot has the same cost on every job site, regardless of the same building even, right? So Things like that, I think, are important. So cross training, make even if it's not even completely cross training, but just giving them the experience to spend a week out on the field in the field for an estimator and vice versa for a project manager. That awareness is going to be tremendous. So I would say, um, you know, if you can have the someone with both talents, that sounds like a great unicorn to me to have. You know, hire as many of those people as you can and pay them real well and make sure you treat them good. On yeah. the flip side take the people you have and give them some exposure to both sides. You're going to ultimately cultivate some of those talents yourself. I, oh. if, I've pulled, if I could just add one thing, I've posted yeah. about this several times on, on LinkedIn as well. You know, I think every company should send their estimators out to the field one day a month, mandatory one day a month, give them certain tasks to go out there and come up with their own costs, take some pictures, you know, and then get the plan sheets, get the sections, get the specs that are involved put it together into a small packet, put it into some kind of a network drive where everyone has access to that, where it's just fresh historical data. And then everybody in the estimating department, whether it's one person, whether it's two people, whether it's a large corporation where they have 10, 15 estimators, everybody has access to all this updated historical data on fresh productions on square footages for carpenters, you know, how much, how much concrete are they getting in on, on certain pores, you know, how much uh, uh, um, drainage pipe are they putting in just, just it, it's, it's constant updating and plus it gives fresh eyes to an estimator to be out in the field as well. So yeah. that's important. Yeah. You know, I would, um, you know, to answer that, I would also add one other thing that just made my, came to my head is, you know, on our team, we, we're trying to make loans and assessing it, but what we're really doing is assessing a project cash flow for a construction project. And um, because we've looked at so many over so many years now, there's a lot of opinions and it built up internal experience. And undoubtedly, we have what we call a credit committee where there's seven or eight of us sitting in a conference room looking at that cash flow and can it be done? Does that make sense? And you know what? It's the 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 room, regardless of the 70 people, and they're all different positions. Some are leaders, some, you know, most are not actually. But the ones that are um all of us at some point or another have brought up a suggestion on something that's actually helped a client be able to be better. Because so I say that because it's good to not make decisions all by yourself. You shouldn't put that burden on yourself as an owner or a leader. Put the project management estimate, estimating team together before a bid goes out um, and actually say, hey, look, this is what I'm bidding. Does this look OK? Am I missing something? If you create a team where they might even meet just once a week just to skim it over or there's a dashboard or a set of basics that get set up and put some more collaboration in there, I think you'd find um, your company will do much better uh, both executing work, but also winning work. Um, Jennifer has a question. Um, she said, our main issue is we want to bid more jobs and we're outsource we are outsourcing our estimates. We feel the individual is doing a good job, but we have recently only started using one. We are now sending our materials cost to him to use in our takeoffs, but some numbers are on and some are way off. What would you suggest there, Jerry? Well, you know, in order to build trust and to build confidence in yourself as the GC, you know, I would certainly check the first couple of bids that they start submitting to you. Um, if, if some are on and some are off, you know, that's, that's certainly a red flag. I mean, not every single estimator is gonna get everything right. Um, it's, it's very difficult to look at a large set of plans and a large, and, and a large spec and, and build a job in your head in two or three weeks, right? So you are gonna miss stuff, uh, on, you know, that's why they caught it in an estimate. 
I mean, you need to be on, on point with that. I would, I would certainly call them out on the stuff that they're lagging on so they can build their system and processes a little bit better as well, because the stronger they become, the stronger you're going to become as well. Right. So, um, I would certainly not, you know, again, this, this is just my thought process. I, I would certainly not just trust every single number that comes in from an outsourced estimator, because at the end of the day, they're not going to be held liable. It's, it's, it's you, it's you and your company and you as the estimator are submitting that estimate, right? So they so, so your boss and, and the owner is not going to want to hear that it was the estimating company that you outsourced to, it was their fault because they can care less about that. So you need to check those numbers. I mean, they're going to do 80, 85% of the work for you, but you need to check those numbers. Jennifer, one of the things I would do is a suggestion there. Um, when you're hiring somebody new, if you're going to outsource estimating, I guess this is good, good for anybody. I think you should run dual paths to hire them, have them do the whole estimate, but you do, your, you do the whole estimate too. And you'll have two comparisons. You can start to see what exactly um, is different between the two bids, which will help guide that person who's doing the estimating for you on what they should be thinking or what they might have missed. It'll also allow you to identify quickly what, what is missing or what is different and why. And I think um, that'll help you in a, in a training scenario because you, you, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of work. Don't get me wrong. Hiring new people is a lot of work. Bringing on an outsourced service is not easy either. Um, but that might be one thing that you could do to help a lot. Um, the other suggestion, and this is this is a cost also, one has a time cost to you, the other one's going to be cost, is hire two estimating companies and let them both bid the same exact jobs, the same exact, same, same exact projects and see how they compare to one another and ultimately just start to get a feel over time with who's got the better bid, who's got the best one, who do you feel more comfortable with when you're communicating back and forth with them, do you get a better feel with one or the other that's capturing it? understand what process they took to come up with their numbers versus just, you know, bidding and then land on something that'll actually help you um, make feel good and comfortable with. That might be another way to do it. If I could just add one more thing, Scott, is instead of giving them the entire project, just take the top five, take the top most important items and you estimate that in-house, you know, and then give them the less important items as well, because outsourcing to two different Estimating companies is, is twice as much money as well. But if you think about it, you know, you need to build a good trustworthy source to get your estimates. So it's a bit of an investment up, up front as well. But like your first option, you know, that's how joint venture partners do it. When, when, when you're working for large corporations who are bidding multi hundred million dollar contractors and they bring on a joint venture partner, both joint venture partners are bidding the exact same items. And then you come in several weeks before the bid and, and, and you brainstorm together. And you see who's more, who's less, who's missing what, and, and that's how it all comes together. So you can look at them as a joint venture partner as well. So there's different ways to, to, to view this situation. It all depends on the size of the project as well and how much time and how many resources you have. Yeah. Like how I said, most contractors are all looking for estimators. So they, they probably lag on the resources of, our, of, of estimators. Another question here, um, and I'm Jerry, I'll let this one go to you. I wouldn't know, but uh, is it industry standard to pay your in-house estimator a percentage of the bid? It, I'm sorry, is it is it industry standard to pay your in-house estimator a percentage if the bid is awarded? And if it is, what is a fair percentage to pay? So I'm assuming he's talking about getting like a bonus, right? Based on the bid. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I I posted this on on one of my on one of my links several months back, and man, it was the one thing that everybody just started to come at with all different kinds of opinions. So I could see this going in 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 a lot of crazy directions. I mean, there's certain things that you really need to be careful with, right? Because if I was an owner of a company and I and I presented that to my estimators, but well, what's going to keep them from putting in a really low bid? Maybe they're strapped with money and they just need that money, right? So it becomes a little dangerous. Um, you want to be able to keep, you want to be able to win a job by, by only leaving 5% on the table as well, meaning of the difference of cost between your bid and, and the second person, right? So, you know, if I were to go that route, if I was an owner, I would say, okay, I'll give you X amount of percent, but it's got to be in within a certain percentage of the second person, right? 
Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? So it's a really tough call. Um, you know, I, I could see opinions really being split on this as well. Um, but at the end of the year, that's where you maybe compensate your, your, your estimators. As the projects get going and as you start seeing that those unit prices and, and that lump sum cost is actually is actually happening and, mm-hmm. and, and, and you're meeting your costs, then at, you know, at the end of the year, you should take care of your estimators via a bonus. Yeah. Uh, a bonus structure per bid gets, gets a little complicated. I, I do have an opinion on this, actually, now I'm listening yeah. to it and thinking it through. Um, you know, I wouldn't do that, honestly, if it was me. I wouldn't do it at all. Um, it could be on, dangerous. Anything yeah. to do with winning. No, because what I think would be more important is we just talked about how important project managers and estimators are. They're, they could be so effective together. I would provide all your incentives around things that are going to be beneficial to the overall business. If your estimating team's winning, but your project manager team's losing or vice versa, you're going to be in trouble. Um, it's going to be worse than it would be better. So what I would do is I would provide incentives on what's going to be good for the business and the team overall that will help bring what you want to happen together. So for example, and this is off the top of my head, I may say, you know what, we're going to, we're going to pay a bonus. We're going to create a bonus pool for executed work that is done within the bid and meets within our profit margins. If we hit our profit margins on this project, then both estimating and project management are going to win together. That pool will be split and you either both win and get paid or you both don't and not not get paid, but I'm sorry, a bonus, a bonus or incentive, something above and beyond their normal compensation. So this is more of recognition and reward than it is a penalty. And, and then I would, that would incentivize them at the same time to join together in the meetings that you want to have together, collaborate back and forth. And then as a business owner, you can't just have one meeting and throw that out there. You also have to provide them the information, which means you do need good software. You need good information so they know where they're doing, how they're tracking towards it month over month, week over week, or however long the project goes. Um, That would be my opinion. That's what I would do. Be much better for the business. Yeah. I mean, I know one contractor who doesn't pay their, their field management staff bonuses until the end of the project to see where profits are. But, you know, that it could have been a bad estimate as well. So that's not fair too. And I know, I know a lot of top talent who would never step foot in the doors of this contractor for that very reason. So bonus structures get very difficult and um, need to be played properly. <laughs> yeah. We could probably have an entire call on compensation structures. So yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah don't take any of this as gospel because it all matters compensation. Um, <laughs> And, and what I suggest, it doesn't mean that should be the only bonus. You can certainly do discretionary bonuses for effective work. Because I'm telling you right now, the best bonus you could pay might be on a job that you only lose 10%. Because your project manager might have done so much, so well, he might have saved you from losing 30. Or he might have yeah. saved you from losing everything. So that doesn't mean that they don't deserve a bonus. They might deserve a bonus more on that than they do on the one that was, you know, bid fat and done clean, you know? <laughs> so. It all goes, it's a lot of things to think about. Um, another question. Yes, this will be recorded and sent to all the attendees. We'll make sure that goes out. It'll be hosted on our YouTube channel for sure. It'll always live there. You can always find that on um, Mobilization YouTube, uh, Mobilization Funding's channel on YouTube. This will be there and be posted. Um, I'll also stick it onto the LinkedIn feed, and we will also send it out to all the people who registered or attended on LinkedIn or Zoom as well. Um, Question. Let's see. Maury has a question. This is how we are doing. Do you feel about how do you feel about involving key craft people with experience for input on tight margin bids? So I've I've seen both sides of this, right? I've seen the side where where field will come in and just everything out of their mouth was put money in, put money in. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. Put money in. And guess what happens after that, right? You end up in last place on the bid. I've also seen bids. I've also been a part of a bid. We were bidding a whole bunch of work up in Massachusetts and the team up there was was helping us out on, on the estimate. They were really slow and they were helping us out on the estimate and they were a major part of, of estimating. I was a senior estimator, so I ran the estimate. We ended up getting the job because they knew so much about the job and within the first couple of months, they valued, they valued engineer the first stage of the project. And right off the bat, boom, the, the agency accepted it. 
and we made an extra $500,000. The agency didn't ask for any refund, nothing like that. Went right down to the bottom line. So I've seen both sides of it. I, I, I've seen where field craft come in. You got to really understand, you know, hence the heading and, and, and the title of this uh, Zoom call. Estimating really is a science and really is an art. You really need to understand how an estimate comes together. And a lot of field craft just don't really understand how that works, right? So for them, it's just put money in, put money in. So it's a really truck, it's a really tricky subject. You gotta, you gotta really understand what they're telling you. You gotta write it down and you gotta digest it properly. And again, that comes with field experience and that comes with experience as well. Um, so you know, it's a bit of a gray area. And, yep. and, and, and it, really, it really comes down to the team and it really understands your knowledge and you really need to digest that information properly. You know, one of the things, um, I'm, as I'm listening to this, I would just put through an ad. I think if you're a smaller company, you don't have these huge departments and you're not bidding, you know, tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars of work. I think the takeaway from here is include your include the talent you do have inside your company together on estimating. If not on every bid or every estimate, at least start to include them on how the estimator might want to start considering the type of work that you're doing. Hey, take this into consideration. There's some nuances to our individual business that just makes it more expensive or, or where we can save. Give the estimator as much perspective and tools as you can, and then collectively sit around a table and look at, maybe you look at every other estimator bid, but just start to invest some time as a team to get your collective team's knowledge as a smaller business into the one estimator or the one or two estimators or, or senior estimator versus a junior estimator, you know, get, get as much information into them from the whole team together and it'll help everybody get a vested interest in what you're trying to accomplish. Um, if you're a huge, big company, you, you might not have the time for all that, but you, but you, you should invest in a, a team meeting schedule where you bring estimators and project managers and you can start to cross train and all those things. But for smaller companies out there, Get your whole collective unit together, leadership all the way through um, to help yourselves. I think you'll find a lot of value in doing that. And um, the perspective of the team will help open up everybody's eyes, both sides, field and estimating. I mean, I had I had one situation where we bought the carpenter in and uh, the carpenter foreman knew that we had, he knew the critical path of, of, this, uh, of this particular project. And he knew that he was able to reuse the forms on an earlier operation and reuse those forms for a later operation, you know, and we had, we had probably $200,000 in on that, on that later operation to, to buy new forms and gang up new forms. And he's like, no, take that money out because we're just going to do it once. And then we're going to bring that to the later operation. So in that particular situation, it was great to have that craft uh, person. I mean, unfortunately we didn't win the job, but if we would have won the job, you know, now we knew that we had that and he would have been held accountable for that. <laughs> well, you know where you see that too, Jerry, is you see like um, jobs where something you, you got a, you got a very intricate building maybe and, yeah. and or a site that's tough. And um, the architect is in charge. All of a sudden they realize like something is off with the design and the engine, the, the, now the architect's trying to figure out a solution to re-engineer it so that we can get back to work. And the smart, the smart architects create something that in their own head that now has a lot of cost to it that drives it crazy, makes it worse. Or they go grab this, if it's a steel, if it's structural steel, for example, they go grab the sub, come here, let me show you the problem. Do you have any field ideas? And all of a sudden, it's the, the architect's yeah. going to get it, but the field engineer expert, the structural steel guys, give them some a solution of something they did before that puts the architect in the right path and it doesn't add any cost. A couple right. quick, quick tweaks, you know? Yeah. And so it's that's the that's the project big picture equivalent of what we're trying to suggest here that you do inside your own squad. Right, exactly. And and, and this goes back to the whole science part of of uh, of estimating, right? So there's different ways to to attack estimating. It's it, it's a process. It takes it takes a it takes a lot of time and um uh, it takes a lot of losing bids and then also analyzing why you lost the bid as well, right? So um, <clears throat> that, that's something that a lot of contractors don't do as well is why did you lose a bid? You know, what were some areas that you could have gained knowledge on that, that, that you didn't even bother to find out more information on? So, yeah.
You know, a friend of mine, Garrett Moss, talked about this at our um, live event. He said, um, you know, one of the most frustrating things is bidding work and then not getting any feedback on it. Like, why did we lose? You know, and he always solicits feedback to every job that he's lost. And he said it gave him a tremendous amount of knowledge and expertise from the people that would would share with him. And it's obviously frustrating to if they don't, but he would ask and he would get that information and it helped him tremendously in growing his business and also changing some of the ways they do things internally to, to bid, to estimate. Yeah, I'm not sure why a lot of contractors and agencies don't don't give the respect to give a contractor why they're lost. You know, I know I know now a lot of these public agencies are going design build and or or best value. So you got to put together like an entire design package, and naturally you're having conversations with a lot of the owners reps and talking about it, and they're and they're telling you what's working and what's not working with your bid in relation to everybody else. So you kind of get a little bit of feedback as well, but that's a big, that's a big major problem in, in this business. I mean, contractors really need to know why they're losing bids. I yeah. mean, it's just, it's just, come on, you know, they, they spent so much money putting together estimates. It's out of respect. Yeah, the, sh- the short answers were they're just busy and they don't feel like they don't feel like doing it. The respect, yeah. give them the difference. And that's, that's just, those are the types of things you got to pick up on if you're in the trades of who you want to work with and who you don't. Yeah, sure. You know? Absolutely. Yep. Well, Jerry, I got I don't see any other questions here. We've gone over an hour now. Um, I just wanted to give you a chance to add anything last minute that you, you know, wanted to address or bring up. Um, let people know where they can find you, what you can how you can help them. Um, if there's anything at all that you can, you know, offer or they need to do, let, let them know how they can get to you. So I'm I'm hot and heavy on LinkedIn. Um I love new connection requests. You know, just send me a connection request and tell me that you heard me on uh, Scott's webinar. I would love to connect. Um, you can reach out to me, DM me on, on LinkedIn. Um, in my profile, you see my email address. It's Jerry with a J, Jerry at pro dash a cell, A-C-C-E-L dot com. Um, and, and that's it. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm more focused on operations, helping contractors improve their inefficiencies, and, uh, and become more efficient, both at estimating and also out in the field. Um, and and I'd love to connect with anybody and have a simple conversation. It doesn't have to be a sales pitch. It's just a simple conversation. <laughs> so thank you, Scott, for having me on. Well, one of the things I like about you, man, is you've been pouring a lot of value into people first. Um, you haven't ever asked for anything. I asked you to come on here because I thought that exact reason. So I think you're thank doing you. a great job, man. I'll keep it up. Awesome. Thanks. Um there is one other question here, and I do want to answer sure. Rachel's question because I'm sure she had it in there and asked for good reason. So do you have criteria or general key points you look for in the feedback phase if you were to ask why you lost? I think that's what she's referring to. Like if you lost, why, well, if you didn't get the bid, why, you know, what would you ask? Why? It, it's general questions, right? So if there's three estimators involved, you just go around the room and you say, hey, what are your thoughts on this? What are things that you were thinking about doing that we didn't? follow through on <clears throat> so just general questions such as that and um you know where there were there areas because there's always a, a, a lot of times where estimators would want to take a, a major cut right before the bid and somebody one of the higher ups is like nah that's that's too risky so once you build more on top of that and 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 bring to the table why you felt that that would have worked out well, right? So bring that education to the table. I mean, listen, three, four, five minds is, is uh, it thinks a lot better than one. So it's just general questions and, and you go around the room and you ask everybody's input of, of why they think that we lost and what we could do better for the next bit as well, so. Well, I think that covers it for the day. I want to thank you all for thank supporting you. us, for coming on. For um, I hope you found this very valuable and it added, um, helped you, gave your answers to your questions, and hopefully we got a little bit better here at estimating today. Um, I did just launch a book that will be post coming out. It's called The Big Book of Cash Flow. It does specifically address a lot of the things we talked about today, just project cash flows, why you run them, how to add margin, how to think about um, markup, the two, the relation between the two of them. Um, I'll be putting that out here sooner or later. It is called The Big Book of Cash Flow. You can't purchase it yet, but it'll be out uh, within a week or so. So you can find us on Mobilization Funding. I'm on LinkedIn, obviously, as well and mobilizationfunding.com. 
and as well as our YouTube channel where we have a lot of this webinar information. This particular webinar will be housed, but there's also lots of great content there to answer some of these questions for you. So appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. And Jerry, I really respect and appreciate your time today, man. Thank you for Thank welcoming you. and uh, joining us. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye Take bye. care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye-bye.